Initially I knew that I wanted to go back to grad school so I started researching and I ended up choosing the K-State program just for a variety of reasons. One, it was online which made it very flexible for me to still have a full-time career but it also provided the opportunity to come on campus and network and engage with my peers and with the faculty here as well. And also just wanted to stick with a university that had a strong reputation and especially had deep roots in agriculture. Thank you for joining us for our AgriPulse Washington Week interview. I'm Spencer Chase, joined as always by AgriPulse Executive Editor Phil Brasher, discussing the week that was, agriculturally speaking, in Washington, D.C. And, and in Washington, D.C. this week, a, a very busy one, uh, you know, not only for us uh, at, at AgriPulse with our uh, Ag and Food Policy Summit earlier this week, but also a very busy week on Capitol Hill in terms of uh, you know, one of the, uh, one of the key debates, uh, one could argue, of the entire year sort of unfolding this week. And that, of course, being the House of Representatives and the Senate uh, coming to some semblance of agreement on the uh, Commodity Credit Corporation in a continuing resolution to fund the government through mid-December. And Phil, of course, uh, you know, this is obviously an issue very important to uh, AgriPulse and AgriPulse readers. So I, I guess what can you say just about the, the, uh, the, the strategy that unfolded and, and what we saw earlier this week in terms of the, uh, the CCC debate? Well, the one big ag, uh, ag issue with this stopgap funding bill was uh, the Trump administration and the USDA were asking for uh, replenishment of the Commodity Credit Corporation account. This is this revolving account that USDA uses to make farm payments. They use it to make marketing loans. Um, and uh, the administration has been using it to make these coronavirus relief payments and the market facilitation program, the, the trade assistance uh, payments before that. Um, USDA was telling Congress that they were going to be down to about $2 billion, according to some numbers I got from Capitol Hill, actually $1.7 billion starting in October when in a month when they have to start, uh, USDA has to start making uh, the farm program payments, uh, farmers start putting crops under marketing loans. Billions of dollars go out um, over the next few months, October, November, December, out of that account. Now, um, Democrats were saying this was a manufactured uh, crisis, uh, that actually uh, USDA can manage that money. And when we saw this bill on Monday, there was no uh, replenishment of the CCC in there. And uh, Republicans quickly said, this is not acceptable. Um, and uh, even some Democrats, especially vulnerable Democrats in the uh, Midwest, um, started putting pressure on the uh, Democratic leadership uh, to address this. So, Phil, I think it's interesting to, to note in particular that, you know, this is a, a debate and an issue that we've kind of seen before. Uh, a year ago, there was kind of a, a similar debate and uh, a disciplined uh, AgriPulse reader might remember uh, the level of fireworks that happened at House Ag Committee hearing uh, over this subject. Uh, so I guess if we wanted to take, a, you know, as, as I mentioned, we've seen this play out before. We've seen this uh, this debate happen. And now we got the same outcome that we got last year. Um, if you wanted to take the uh, sort of the generous point of view on the part of the, the Democratic Party, what, what, what did they gain by going through this debate this time? Well, they would argue that they've got some uh, Republican agreement to also include some uh, about $8 billion in nutrition assistance, basically an extension of, uh, of assistance that had been provided uh, back in the spring, uh, relief for additional food assistance for those who've been unemployed and thrown out of jobs, uh, otherwise affected by the pandemic. A big portion of this uh, called uh, the basically provided meal replacements for kids who were uh, not going to school and getting their school lunches. That was set to, that authority is set to expire at the end of this month. So they would say they got, they got, Democrats would say they got that in this deal. Uh, Republicans uh, were prepared to offer uh, at least part of that anyway. However, um, the other thing is there was a lot of, uh, concern, particularly coming from uh, Debbie Stabenow, the top Democrat on the Senate Ag Committee, about the way that uh, the administration was using the CCC um, in a way that we just have not seen, in, at least certainly not in my memory, uh, of the kind of money that was being moved out of there 
into, into these ad hoc payments, starting with the MFP, continuing this year with the coronavirus relief payments, the CFAP. And Democrats were very frustrated by that, and they felt like it was really being used in a political way. And what I was picking up is that there was concern that there was going to be even more, uh, there were going to be even more uh, special payments going out uh, before the election. But uh, I suppose the moral of the story is uh, the CCC funding was included in the uh, in the CR. It has uh, passed the House, and uh, you know it, one would seem uh, or one would think a, a government shutdown has has been avoided. And uh, we'll obviously keep you up to date on uh, future uh, negotiations uh, because uh, there is that December eleventh timeline uh, looming now. Uh, during which uh, between now and then, uh, going to need to come to some kind of an agreement to avoid a shutdown uh, in December ele- in December. Um, Obviously, the election probably going to play a role in uh, how long that extension might be. Uh, plenty of things to watch on that front uh, between now and then. Uh, another thing that we're going to be watching on Capitol Hill, and we saw, you know, uh, we could probably generously call it movement on the subject this week, is the, the, the broader subject of coronavirus relief, uh, not only for agriculture, but for the economy writ large. And Phil, uh, we did see that there appears to be a, a willingness to to re- restart these negotiations, as well as some uh, some posturing on the part of House Democrats? Well, uh, <laughs> how you interpret it, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a lot of people, it's puzzling to a lot of folks. We've really been at this impasse uh, on Capitol Hill for weeks now over whether to have another another big package of coronavirus to relief, uh, kind of like the CARES uh, uh, CARES Act we saw back in March. We haven't really had one of that size. That was over $3 trillion. Democrats put a very large one. Actually, that was closer to $2 trillion. I think the Democrats subsequently passed a bill in May that was over $3 trillion. Didn't go anywhere in the Senate. Uh, Republicans don't want to spend anywhere close to that. Their upper limit is about 1.3 to 1.5 trillion dollars. Uh, House Democrats have been uh, saying we're going to need well over two trillion dollars. Uh, no sign of any movement on that. Now this week, uh, on Thursday, uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, came out was considering a two point putting a 2.4 trillion dollar bill on the floor possibly next week. And uh, no one's quite sure whether that's intended to, to restart negotiations or to have something that uh, our vulnerable, vulnerable Democrats can vote on or what exactly is going on. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Republicans on the hills are still pretty skeptical that uh, they're going to get a deal before the election. So obviously that's something that uh, remains to be seen in terms of how uh, how Congress is going to react to the uh, the lingering effects of the coronavirus on the American economy. But we do have uh, one answer from the Trump administration in terms of how they plan to react. Uh, we did see uh, within the last week the second round of the coronavirus food assistance program uh, underway, uh, sign up now underway on that. Um, you know, obviously we saw CFAP1 roll out earlier this year, the, the $16 billion direct payment program didn't quite get to the $16 billion in actual payments. Uh, but Phil, uh, I, saw, I suppose sort of at a high level view, what do we know in terms of differences between, between that program and this one uh, that farmers can now sign up for? Well, the rules are different. Um, they're more expansive and the commodities that are covered are as expansive as they possibly could be. <laughs> Just about anything that uh, you that uh, you grow, um, uh, either plants or animals, and sell for food or fiber, uh, it qualifies. Uh, there's an exception for breeding stock. Uh, breeding stock doesn't qualify, but just about everything else. We even have tobacco and hemp and uh, goat's milk. Um, all sorts of things. Uh, the rule, and again, the rules are different. I would recommend you go to the uh, go to our uh, agripulse.com. We have a pretty extensive uh, description of the program and also links to the uh, farmers.gov, the USDA site. Um, if you're qualified, if you think you qualify or might qualify for this program, go there because uh, you know it, it's very complicated. It takes a while. You just have to look at you have to look up your specific crop situation. 
So uh, enrollment started uh, this past Monday and runs through December 11th. And they're currently estimating that uh, we'll spend about 13, over $13 billion on this, but uh, we'll see. They, it's a, a bit of a guesstimate on their part. So obviously a lot going on in, in the grand scheme of foreign policy right now between the Commodity Credit Corporation debate, uh, you know, the broader subject of COVID relief, and also what, uh, what we know, what we concrete uh, can, can point to on, on the subject of coronavirus relief. So a lot of things going on, a lot of reasons for you to stay tuned to agripulse.com over these next couple of weeks as we continue to cover uh, the, uh, you know, a lot of different developments in foreign policy as well as a lot of different things that are going to be important in the grand scheme of the election uh, between now and that first Tuesday and November. But I think that's going to do it for this week. So for Phil Brasher, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one.